muting myself. And then so you can kind of count down from 10. I'm about to start broadcasting. Have a good show, guys. Thank you. All right, everybody ready to get started? Great, um, so my name is Lucy Kassir. I'm the Director of Education and Engagement here at the Columbus Museum. And we are so excited that everyone is joining us today for our Birds and Art Talk in celebration of Migratory Bird Month. So the way the program today will go is we will start off with a conversation between Jason Sansaver and Jonathan Frederick Walls, and then we will have a special guest. If you have questions for any of our speakers, please type them into the chat or you can use the Q&A function as well. Um, we will answer some of those as we go along and then we'll do a longer Q&A at the end. So without further ado, let's introduce our, our first two speakers for today. So Jason Sansaver is originally from South Dakota and he has been educating about birds and conservation for over 15 years. He, with a life in music and theater before that, so an artist. Um, he has traveled all over the country with his work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services and is currently the Director of Education uh, and Outreach at, at Audubon, Nebraska for the National Audubon Society. He is a self-proclaimed bird nerd specializing in birding by ear and a huge fan of the connections between art and the natural world. So thank you so much for joining us today, Jason. My pleasure. Thanks for being here. Excited. And we are also joined today by Jonathan Frederick Walls, who is the curator of American art and the director of curatorial affairs at the Columbus Museum and an expert on American modernism. Jonathan has been bird watching since his childhood in Baltimore, Maryland. And he is currently working on a traveling exhibition, Alma W. Thomas, Life is, or excuse me, Everything is Beautiful, which has a section on the artist's involvement in the natural conservation movements of the 1960s and 1970s. Um, Jonathan, and Jonathan also currently lives in Columbus, Georgia with his two indoor cats, Wolfie and Winky. So some bird fans there as well. So I'm gonna pop my video off and let Jonathan and Jason take over and I'll see you all back here soon. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Lucy, and welcome to everyone in our audience. We're super excited to bring art and the natural world together today in this dialogue. And <clears throat> I wanted to give a special shout out to um, Jason for joining us. Thank you so much. Um, Jason and I have known each other for a few years now and we uh, first met each other in Lincoln, Nebraska. Jason's still um, kind of based nearby um, where his nature, where the, the nature center where he works um, is in that part of Nebraska. And speaking of land, I wanted to start um, with a land acknowledgement. Uh, we acknowledge that the Columbus Museum is located on the traditional land of the Muscogee Creek peoples, past and present. And we want to honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. Furthermore, we believe this land acknowledgement calls us to commit to continuing to learn how to be better stewards of the land we inhabit. Speaking of stewardship, we have a super special guest star who's making an appearance. <laughs> this is Winky the cat who wants everybody to know that if and when you 
would like to have a cat adopt you in your life, you should, as best as possible, uh, visit local shelters. There are so many animals that need our help that are based there. Um, and please keep cats indoors. Um, it's really good for the health of the cat, but it's really important because cats are basically killing machines and songbirds are something that they really uh, go after outdoors. And so they're actually a really big factor in uh, the decline of songbirds, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so we will start with a local image. If we could have the first uh, work from the Columbus Museum collection. And what we're going to do is we'll have the works on screen. Jason's going to go first and talk a little bit from the naturalist perspective about um, the feathered friends in the images. And then I'll follow up with a couple of uh, fun facts about the artist and um, some other things about the work and that person's career. So Jason, take it away. Awesome. So this is a beautiful painting. Um, it looks like to me, um, and Jonathan and I went back and forth on this because um, I think at first we originally thought morning dove in this photo, and that's very possible. Um, but there's not a lot of speckling. And because the bird looks very calm in the hand, it's very likely that it could be a domestic turtle dove, which is domesticated from the Eurasian collared dove. It's hard to see for sure um, without seeing the back detail on the bird, but it was a very common practice at that time, um, having um, either caged or pet birds, um, especially doves and pigeons, because they were around, they'd been domesticated. Um, Beautiful little birds. They're a great um, species that anyone can see. They're resident all across the United States pretty much. So um, whether you live in an urban area or way out in the field, there's probably a dove species from the morning dove, the Eurasian collar dove, to down in the south, they've got larger white wing doves. Um, so it's a really great species that people can learn and enjoy. Um, and the mournful calls of most of the species are really well known, right? A lovely so um, I love seeing this and starting off with this one, um, especially as it's a bird that um, most people are probably familiar with um, in such a loving, like kind of the way it's depicted. It's such a, it's not a caged bird or anything. It's just, she's just about to pet it in such a tender way. So I think that's just lovely. Um, your, our, our trouble in identifying the bird um, is one of two mysteries about this painting. And actually, um, we're not just unsure about what bird this is, but we're actually a little unsure about who's depicted. Um, we have titled it Anne Elizabeth Lewis Wynne. And Wynne, of course, is the family um, <clears throat> who gives its name to Winton, the neighborhood, and Winton Road the street that the Columbus Museum is on. Um, but it's a little um, murky about whether this is the mother or the daughter. And the only reason I still want to hold out a little bit for Morning Dove is that this may be a memorial portrait of the mother, right? So then the morning would kind of go along with the thematics. So still a mystery. We have research to do, um, but we're, we appreciate learning more about um, the bird that's in it, at least the sort of general um, category. This artist was born in Connecticut, but began working in out, uh, Louisiana as an artist. Um, I learned this fun fact while I was researching for our talk today that actually uh, Parker studied um, art he took lessons in England, and that's where he actually met John James Audubon. And we'll talk more about that artist in a little bit. Um, but I thought that was a really interesting connection and maybe why there's also a bird in this particular image as well, that sort of interest that he um, sort of probably, you know, he and Audubon probably talked a lot about um, animal illustration. Um, so he's demonstrating his abilities here 
um, with the two animals that are in the composition. Um, after he came back from England, he settled in New Orleans eventually, and he opened a studio there. But during the 1830s and 1840s, he traveled all across the Deep South and became an itinerant portrait painter. And that's why we have our, our painting at the museum. He did stop in Columbus and was able to um, paint portraits of uh, several prominent people. And we're lucky to have this particular image in the collection. Can we have the next slide, please? Real quick question, Jonathan, while we wait yeah. for the next one to come up. Do we know the type of dog in, that is down in there? I haven't really looked into that. So that's something else to uh, sort of think about maybe. And of course, dogs in art traditionally have uh, indicated fidelity. So that might also um, be part of the theme that's going on if it's a memorial portrait. Very cool. I just noticed um, when you mentioned earlier about your cat and cats and their love of birds, um, yeah. that dog seemed very interested in that dove as well. So. Yeah. Can you tell us about um, this next picture? Yeah. So this is um, a jack snipe, which is not a North American um, bird. It is from um, Europe. Um, it is a game bird um, that was hunted. Um, and this is a really lovely portrait, um, very, I would say, realistic um, mm -hmm. as it would hung in a still life like that. Um, very similar to Wilson's snipe, which is the bird we have throughout the United States. Mm -hmm. um, the common snipe, which is also related, um, is what ours used to be called in the United States until they realized they were different species. Uh -huh. um, that happened a lot, actually, when uh, settlement happened. There were lots of birds from um, let's say the old country, and as settlement happened, um, they just compared it to what they knew um, until we found out much later with science that they weren't necessarily related. So there's lots of old names that aren't necessarily correct on the birds um, mm -hmm. that we've fixed um, through research since. Um, but I do love this one. Something really cool that um, you can see so well in this about snipe um, is that long beak which is for probing down into like soft soil and mud. They are a shorebird, but they tend to be more off the water and kind of in the uh, partially wooded areas where the soil is soft. But their, um, their beak end is almost more sensitive than their tongue so that they can feel when their beak is down in the mud and sense for earthworms and grubs and things. And it can open the very last third of things like woodcocks, snipe, birds like that, it can open separately kind of the last third of the beak to be able to grab them, right? So that the whole mouth doesn't have to open while it's under the soil. It's an amazing type of bird. Um, and um, the other thing to note is those feet, right? Um, very, very long slender toes, but not webbed. So not a swimming bird, but for especially being able to be very light on sinky mud or water if they're walking along. Um, so that it kind of keeps them up. There's a bird related, the um, jacana that has that even extended longer, super long toes for walking on like water lilies and things like that. So it's really fun to see this, uh, this piece and learn about it a little more, especially because that bird, I mean, you wouldn't know that this wasn't a photograph. That is really, really well done. If you've seen these birds in real life, that's what they look like. That's a good point. Um, this style of uh, image making is called trompe l'oeil from the French. That phrase means to trick the eye. And so the point of this kind of mode of working is to try and make something so realistic that the viewer wants to, like, thinks that it really is real and wants to reach out and touch it. And I think um, certainly the shadow here and the the really fine details add, um, like enhance that aspect of this painting. Um, the museum also has another trompe l'oeil painting that's a still life and it's a, kind of a container with peanuts in it. And it looks like they're kind of coming into your space and you can maybe grab one. Um, this artist, you know, like so many 19th century artists sort of like found his way um, 
in his career by following his nose. So he first was a sign and decorative painter in that sense, but then um, eventually turned to portraiture. And then from portraiture, and I think it's apparent in this work because you use the word portrait to, to describe this image, um, he finally settled on animal painting, which only kind of became a thing like after um, the turn, after mid-century in the 19th century. Um, and so he's one of the artists who decide that they're going to take this sort of um, subcategory of uh, still life and really make it their own. So he, his, he's best known today for his animal paintings. Um, because of hunting and the associations with this work, I really wanted to bring in the idea about um, how humans have hunted birds, you know, forever. Um, but a particular um, kind of way that humans used bird feathers specifically was actually how the Audubon Society got started, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm glad you bring that up because images like this sometimes, especially with bird lovers, can be a little controversial, right? It's, it's not showing a live bird. Um, but I always like harken back to um, Audubon himself, who shot tons of birds for science. We didn't have photographs, we didn't have binoculars to be able to study from afar. So to be able to do research, especially on birds at the time, um, shooting them was the way to be able to get close and really learn about them. Um, before that, it would have been hunting um, to do still life like this. Um, there was market hunting and there were some that went overboard. Um, but what you mentioned especially was um, Audubon, especially along the Texas coast and Louisiana coast, there was a huge market. Um, I believe there was also a section up in the um, Southern Oregon, Washington area there in the wetlands where tons of birds like egrets and herons with beautiful um, plume feathers in their breeding plumage were just shot almost to extinction. Um, and it took several people, mostly women actually, to start the first small Audubon chapters. They weren't called that yet. Um, but they started talking to each other and really to stop um, women from wearing so many hats with those so that the market wouldn't feed the demand. Um, and by doing that, Audubon sort of was formed with these chapters all across the country. Um, it also stopped the, um, the market for egg collecting um, mm -hmm. because people were actually taking them out of nests. Um, so it was very, very pivotal at that time um, and uh, Audubon in Texas still celebrates that with a Women in Conservation Award, um, really recognizing how the um, women at that time like made the choice to stop wearing those hats, to ask others to stop doing the same, um, and made a big difference in the bird conservation world. That's a great sort of shout out to a show that we have at the museum right now called And So She Did, and it's about um, women in the Chattahoochee Valley and like many, many remarkable things that women did in our local region. And it's in celebration of um, the amendment that allowed women to vote, um, whose anniversary we're selling, celebrating this year. Um, I'm glad you brought up um, the Gulf of Mexico because the next uh, image, if we could have that, um, this is an artist who was born in New Orleans um, and studied in the East, but ended up um, living and working in Ocean Springs, Mississippi. Um, and he's especially known for helping out his brother, Peter, who ran what's called Shearwater Pottery. It was a um, ceramic manufacturing um, company, basically, um, based there. And um, Anderson uh, worked for the WPA during the Depression. He painted murals. Unfortunately, in 1937, he um, was experiencing a lot of symptoms and was eventually diagnosed as schizophrenic. So he spent three years um, sort of in and out of hospitals, but he really used art as a way to um, express himself and I think it was really helpful in his therapeutic process. I just wanted to sort of bring that in because 
the time we're living in is so stressful. And I think it's really important for us all to remember that not just physical health, but mental health is really important and art can certainly help with that. Um, so I wanna give a shout out to all the folks who struggle with mental disability and just remind everyone that um, art is a great way to sort of maintain your sanity when you're stressed out. Um, so this is a pelican, again, with the sort of still life of a dead object. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this bird sp species, Jason? Yeah. So this is a picture, it looks like, of a dead brown pelican. Um, we have two pelican um, species in North America, American white pelican and the brown pelican. Brown pelicans would have been seen all along the coast. They preferred salt water. They're the famous ones that dive from above um, down into the water, um, into a school of fish and gulp up. Whereas the white pelicans will work in teams on freshwater lakes um, and kind of school the fish in between them and scoop them up. One of the ways you can tell, even in this, um, there is a little color in there of the brown, but even if you didn't have the color, if you look at the beak, there's no knob. So American white pelicans, as they age and grow into um, breeding age, after about a year or two of, of uh, juvenile, they get this big knob on their beak, which brown pelicans don't have. And so that's oh. not here either. So that's another really great way to tell um, if I didn't have the name of this or I uh, didn't know where it came from, that it was a brown pelican. Um, I loved when you um, uh, first showed me this image because it made me think of what's happened recently in the Gulf Coast, right, with yeah. the uh, BP oil disaster um, and whether or not this bird had, you know, died from things like that. It's a big part of what Audubon talks about is ways that we can help birds by providing better habitat, um, keeping uh, disasters like that from not happening again. Um, it is a lot of what we do. Um, and I know there's still work going on years later now on rehabbing that whole section of the Louisiana, Texas coast um, for birds like this pelican and many other um, shore and wading birds that need that area. It's really remarkable to me, actually. Like I, like I, I just, like those events are so devastating. It just seems like impossible that nature could ever recover. And, you know, we're thankful for folks who are involved in those rescue and rehab efforts. Um, but it just seems, you know, also to point to, um, you know, how resilient nature can be. Um, we certainly don't need to antagonize nature, but um, it certainly, you know, it just boggles my mind that um, life is still going on um, in the natural world after that devastating event. I remember very specifically because the art museum I was working at, at the time, we wanted to think about ways that we could maybe address that issue um, at the museum specifically. Yeah, and I wanna, something else this made me think of as someone who has been lucky enough in my career to help survey birds in many areas across the country. Um, this isn't an uncommon scene for both unfortunate reasons and pretty natural reasons. Mm -hmm. um, we would do turn censuses, right, for um, turns that would nest all along the coast. And as you were surveying all the live birds, you would find birds that died because maybe food resources weren't enough that year or because there was just a few too many and they had a territorial fight. There's many natural reasons that we do find, you know, dead birds on the shore. So um, I love just seeing kind of the rack and stones and everything around the pelican as well. It seems very natural in its unnatural state almost. Yeah. The, the composition is kind of remarkable. Like it, it it feels very much to me that he happened upon this on the beach, right? That he didn't kill the bird or, or harm the bird in any way, but that he's documenting something that he came across as he was beachcombing. Um, let's use that as a segue to the next image, please. Um, speaking of interesting compositions, um, one of the things that Audubon is noted for is these very dynamic compositions that he created. Um, you mentioned earlier that he did um, shoot birds and would use wires to um, kind of get them to pose 
naturally after they expired. Um, and so through that process, we get these really lifelike sort of vignettes, almost sort of like uh, mini movie stills of what happens in the natural world. Um, tell us a little bit about this thrush, which I think of as a very southern bird, actually. Yeah, um, it's actually not. We have the same bird here in Nebraska. Um, and the name at the time was what it was called. Um, for those that maybe don't know the word ferruginous, that is that beautiful rusty color, comes from the iron oxide color, right? The rust name. Um, this is actually a brown thrasher, or that's the common name we use for it now. Um, gorgeous bird, one of the most amazing singers. They're in the mimic family, like mockingbirds, so they have tons of other bird songs that they can sing just one after the other. Um, they're pretty large, big golden eye. One of the things I love about both this bird and this portrait of them is they are that dramatic. This is to me like the house thrushes of Columbus, right? Like they're like, it's such a <laughs> melodrama reality show. Um, and it seems a little forced or faked, like the one like that is keeling over the snake at the, at the bottom is a little like melodramatic, but it's, I've seen this literally within this past month, I've watched a thrush at its territory, find a bull snake near it, right? Wasn't coming after it, but just harass the heck out of that snake and chase it out of the territory. They're, uh, they've got a pretty big beak to be able to do that. And they're very fearless um, in protecting their territory. Um, I love how Audubon always posed them in a natural native plant or a plant that was around at the time. Um, mm -hmm. So you can see that great green, that uh, bramble that it's in right there. That's what they nest in, in the thicket. Um, so it's always one of, one of the things that I loved about Audubon and which took especially nature art at that time, just literally to the next reality because yeah. there were great other artists working um, Wilson was probably the most famous, but they're very static. It's a beautiful rendering of the bird, but it looks like a museum bird, and that's what he was painting. Whereas these look like a scene that you would see out on the prairie or out in the, you know, down in the uh, areas near Columbus and in Georgia. So, like, I just love these so much. And again, one of my favorite birds, and right now is the best time to hear them. So, if you've got a chance to get out in a backyard or a park safely and listen, these guys are singing for territory like nuts from now until the end of the month. Um, I should mention, this is the state bird of Georgia. Um, and um, something that you reminded me of, um, we've talked about how the composition is really lively and that's um, enhanced by the way that these birds are um, sort of enacting this mini drama. Um, I have to say that I have to tell this personal experience from looking at the works by Audubon and his followers in our collection, I think almost a year ago. Um, by far and away, even if you had no idea, and we were basically looking at everything to make sure like what was authentic and what was sort of after the fact and even maybe something from the 20th century. And these Audubon prints are hand colored with watercolor. And in real life, if you, especially if you have a magnifying glass, it just enhances that quality of liveliness. It's, it's sort of hard to describe. Um, I hope everyone at some point can get to see um, a real live Audubon print, um, but that that hand coloring makes all the difference in the world. Um, and I should give a shout out to our uh, sister museum in Auburn, um, the Jules Collins Smith Museum has about a hundred of these prints. And when they're open to the public, they regularly rotate them so that you're able to see a lot of them um, in, you know, over the, the course of a particular year. Um, I was, uh, fascinated to remember that a hundred is only almost a quarter of the total that were in this publication that Audubon spent from 1827 to 1838 putting together. There were a total of 435 species that he documented and every single composition is just as amazing as this one. Let's go to the next slide. 
So Jason, this is a great example of that sort of less lively uh, kind of composition and more scientific. So could you tell us a little bit about this species? Yeah, so this is a belted kingfisher. Um, and you can tell right away that belt is that beautiful actual blue line, not the red, um, going across here, kind of the upper. Um, both um, male and female have that. Only the female, and it's kind of different in this bird, um, which is kind of unique, where the female has the more bright colors. Um, that doesn't happen in most of the bird species, right? Some phalaropes do that. Um, most of the time it's the male showing off with bright feathers to show how healthy they are, that they've got territory to um, hold. Um, but for some reason in the kingfishers, the female has the bright belly band as well as the belt across the top. Um, they're an amazing bird, sort of just a little smaller than a crow. Um, that big beak is for grabbing fish and they will dive from above. Um, they kind of need enough clear enough water to be able to see the small fish species. Um, and even if they can't get it down their throat to swallow whole, they will catch it. And I watched um, a female who needed to feed young ones. It was like maybe 30 minutes that she just like, I think I got tired before she ever did of watching, but like smacking a fish against the stick that she was on on the branch to smush it up and break the bones so that she could swallow it um, and get it down. But um, they're really amazing. We have um, three kinds of kingfishers in the United States. This is by far the most common, the uh, belted kingfisher, pretty much found all across the country is wherever there's fresh water to be able to fish in. And then right along the Rio Grande Valley, we have two other really stunning um, species of kingfisher, the green kingfisher, which is much smaller, and then the ringed kingfisher, which is huge, bigger than a crow. They're like really a big kingfisher. Um, pretty uncommon and hard to find, but this one is a really fun one. They're also really talkative. So if they see you near, they will make this ch -ch 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 rattling noise and like tell you that they're around. Um, so hopefully if you've got some creeks or ponds around, um, watch for this bird. Um, and it's a lovely rendering of them. It's a little, again, to me, on um, just personal, it's a little flat. It looks like the bird. I could identify what it is, but it doesn't seem as lively as like those Audubons or other things where the bird is obviously like doing behavior or anything. But for the original reasons, I'm sure like you, like that looks just like that bird. Yeah, um, that's a good um, way to talk about that the, the overarching project that this was part of was very scientific. Um, it was part of, it was intended for a very large project about the natural world that the French uh, aristocracy and government were funding. Um, and in fact, it was led by the person who was um, the head of the Royal Botanical Gardens under Louis the 15th. So this is a French artist that's working in the US um, and uh, th this project was to basically sort of document all known, you know, animals. And so um, the point more than Audubon was just to make it very easily recognizable um, and sort of show very plainly the characteristics of this particular species. Um, the artist Nicolas I'm sorry, Francois Nicolas Martinet was actually trained as an engineer and an architectural draftsman, but he's better known today actually for just these images. Um, he um, also was an engraver, and so he was the uh, engraver of record for this particular um, project. Cool. Um, also, Something, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Something I just wanted to note, like that just adds to what you said was like, if I, if I were to look at, um, one of the ways we research birds is bird banding. And so we also check if the bird has all their feathers. It's a way to age them, figure out how old they are. Um, and I have a feeling if I were to look at this image up close, like the amount of feathers is correct. Like I feel like it's that detail. Like you can see the primary feathers and the coverets and it's the right amount of them. So like definitely Francois did like all of the research. It's, it's really really cool. Um, I love the title um, because it really demonstrates very in a, a very practical way how different cultures think and talk about animals. Um, so we call it in, in 
Anglophone world, we call it belted kingfisher. Um, the French title literally says that it's a fisher with a crest. So the, the thing that the French speaking um, colonists fixated on was the fact that it had this, these feathers on the top of its head. That is so cool. I love knowing that. That's, it's one of the, my favorite things. I'm learning more about birds right now. There are so many other names for birds in other cultures, in other languages. Um, Red-winged blackbird is my favorite. Everybody knows that name, but in Spanish it's called Sargento for Sargent, his little epaulet. <laughs> that's really awesome. That's awesome. The um, let's go to the next slide. So Jason, I know you a little bit, and I know that you're a fan of horror films. So I have a feeling this is the patron bird of horror film enthusiasts. Tell us more. Yes, I literally, I wish I would have got it in time. I just ordered a t-shirt that says this bird's nickname on it really big with a picture of the bird, which is Butcher Bird. <laughs> um, and this one I had to look up because the name didn't strike me at first. And that's because this is a European version of the uh, shrike but it's related to our loggerhead shrike and northern shrike we have in North America. Very, very similar bird. Um, the shrikes are what you would call a non-raptor raptor. They're the only bird that um, eats um, other prey like small rodents, lizards and things, but doesn't have talons. So to be able to deal with like eating that, um, plus they're not a large bird, right? They're blue jay size or smaller. Mm -hmm. so to be able to swallow something, they need to rip it in pieces. So if you look close in this image, you can see that little hook right on the end of the beak and mm -hmm. shrikes are notorious for that. But they need something to hold on to the food while they're ripping. And so what they do is they always either have as their territory a very thorny shrub or now in more modern times, barbed wire is very popular. Mm -hmm. and they will stick that lizard, that insect, or that shrew or mouse on the barb, rip it apart, and then leave pieces almost like a larder for later or to feed to the little ones. So it's, um, some people get really creeped out by it, but if you want to know if a shrike is around, look for a thorny shrub with a bunch of little dead things hanging from it like ornaments. <laughs> Um, this artist was actually born in England, but spent 65 years documenting insects and birds in Georgia. So I kind of wonder if the title that we're given here um, is maybe the English name for the, the, the European version of this bird. Um, and he just assumed that it was the same. Um, they do look fairly similar, but I think there might be a few um, distinctive uh, traits to each um, particular one. So I'm, I'm thinking of it because this artist spent so much time in Georgia, basically his career, um, that this is actually a northern shrike. Um, he was based mostly on the eastern side of Georgia, so Savannah, Augusta area, um, and um, but his really his greatest accomplishment was you know helping science know about the insects in that region of the country he was um not only interested in birds but actually much more interested in um insects and he published a scientific survey of insects of georgia in 1797 and that ended up being actually the only published uh, book that he produced, even though he made all of these um, illustrations that he must have sold individually or in portfolios. Um, and a lot of these ended up at the Natural History Museum that's in London because his market was on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, let's go to the next slide. I love this artist. Um, his name is Gustav Bauman, and he's one of the most important printmakers of the, 20th, the first half of the 20th century, if not the entire 20th century. Um, he studied in Munich and Chicago, worked then in Illinois and Indiana in the Midwest, and then in 1918, he settled in New Mexico and spent the rest of his life and career um, in that state. Why I wanted to bring this in is to talk a little bit about um, the symbolic uses of birds. Um, 
when we showed the pelican image, for example, we didn't, um, I didn't mention that in art history, pelicans are actually this symbol that get allied with um, Christ and Christianity and, and self-sacrifice because it was believed that when pelicans didn't have anything to feed their young, they would uh, basically peck their breasts so that it bled and their young would be able to um, eat that way. Um, but this, these images come from uh, petroglyphs created by the Anasazi culture. Um, this is the indigenous population that is basically the ancestors of today, uh, what we know as Pueblo Indians, which are uh, based mostly in New Mexico. Um, and this was from another sort of documentary project um, even though these aren't live birds, they're images of birds. Um, they, these petroglyphs are found in the Pajarito Plateau of Northern New Mexico. Um, the original petroglyphs date between 1150 and 1500 of the Common Era. Um, and uh, Bauman was commissioned to produce basically this very small edition artist book um, that came out in 1939 that documented the most important petroglyphs from that particular canyon, Frijoles Canyon. Um, so I love his work. I think um, I love the way that he's um, not just discussing nature, but the importance of nature to the indigenous cultures of uh, that region of the country. Um, and doing it in this very graphic way that I think um, enhances, um, well, in a sense, like the wood, in, the wood carving that he's doing is very similar to the stone carving that would have been uh, sort of employed to make these images in the rocks themselves. Um, let's go to the next slide. So let's talk about crows, real talk about crows, go. <laughs> crows. So, um, yeah, smartest birds other than parrots. Um, I know there is a lot of um, symbology and imagery around crows and um, corvids. From the bird world, they are known as being um, one of the species, especially recently, that we really look to to learn more just about bird intelligence and what that means. It's so different from um, even just 30 years ago of what we realized um, one, just realizing that animals and birds just think differently, like what does intelligent mean, right? Um, but like how they use it, and they're so smart. Um, one of the um, researcher or the uh, studies that I'll mention is in California, they did a study on whether or not they recognized human faces by, um, they would harass them, and then they, that same person would wear a mask <laughs> or not, but they could tell by things they were wearing and what they'd walked that it was the same person, even wow. if they were masked or hooded. Like they're extremely smart. They can solve puzzles. Um, they also get a bad rap because of that, jays and uh, crows and things, because they can thus get into human houses. They can get into food. Um, I think of the stories back um, when milk was delivered in... Um, jugs that had wax or a loose cap over the top they could get right in or knock it over and learn so like they've always been a little like loved and hated at the same time um i love them um they have a language that's another thing we know about intelligence is they have so many more noises that they can make that we didn't realize after studying um that there's a whole range of communication going on more than just like caw Car, right? <laughs> um, just briefly, because I want to get to the special guest in a minute. Um, yeah. This artist was based in the Pacific Northwest, and you may be able to um, sort of see through the materials that he's using, which is rice paper and sumi a ink, um, that he was very interested in Asian, Asian culture and Asian religions. Um, and so um, often his bird images are single birds or like this, and they have this kind of mystical quality to them that I think um, is part of that 
sort of exploration on the artist's behalf of uh, different cultures and different um, religions. Um, very much in that transcendentalist vein of thinking about nature and spiritualism very closely linked together. Um, let's go to the next to last slide, please. This is another crow image and um, this artist was based uh, mostly in Auburn for her career. She taught at Auburn University, though she was born in Savannah and grew up in Dothan. Um, she started out as a portrait painter and then in 1986 sort of decided to stop uh, like taking commissions for portraits um, and decided to just sort of do her own works. But she maintained this interest in the figure um, I learned today that this is part of a series of 10 different folding screens um, and they were created um, after the 2002 death of her partner. So the original title of the entire series was called Leavings um, and the theme was sort of this um, way to, to treat movement and departure. So we can see here this kind of maybe like a train station where all of these people are sort of milling around. Um, she added the crows in cages late in the creative process. She felt like it kind of needed something. Um, and she's often known for this kind of these small surrealist details. Um, so the combination of this seen from everyday life with this very sort of unexpected juxtaposition is fairly typical of her work. I remember you said you particularly were interested in this piece. We're seeing a detail here. Yeah, I loved when I first saw this and I wasn't sure at first, my first thought these might be minas, but you don't see any of the color that a mina would have, mainly because minas were kept caged so much because they sing beautifully and they can talk. Um, but then the more I looked at it, I got a real feeling of um, like the idea of the daemon from um, His Dark Materials, the F Pullman novels, um, of almost like a soul that's with, like some other piece of the person that they're carrying with them that normally we wouldn't be able to see. But that was just an interpretation that came to me. But um, it also just made me think of how often and still to this day, and it's a big issue, that there is a bird market, right, for like capturing um, illegal like birds from South America that are beautiful or that sing and shipping them, you know, and smuggling them around the world. Um, it's something Audubon works on with our partners in South America and up in the boreal forest of Canada. So, um, yeah. That's a great segue. Um, and this image is a great segue, um, thinking about the relationship between birds and humans. We're going to switch now to our very special guests from the Chattahoochee Nature Center. We'll be back after this segment. Hi, everyone. Hope you've enjoyed our discussion so far. We are now going to be welcoming our special guests, as Jonathan said, from the Chattahoochee Nature Center. We are joined today by Christy Hill and a female barn owl. So Christy, go ahead. Hi. So thank you so much for having me join you guys today. It's a really nice partnership we have. Um, you can see more details about me and the Nature Center on the chat that um, we're working on right now. And I have with me today one of our non-releasable resident raptors. Um, she is a barred owl. You can see a little bit about her pattern. She has bars here on her chest, vertical bars going down this way as well. She is one of four owls that live in Georgia and we're going to show you a picture in just a second of those owls. Um, she may get a little nervous. She's still a wild animal even though she's one of our non-releasable birds and we've had her since about 2002. But um, she's connected to me so if she decides she wants to fly then we won't lose her. She'll stay here. She might bait off of my arm just a little bit. So we have four species of owls in Georgia. You can see over here on the left is the barred owl. It's a picture of her probably. 
Um, next is that Rufus Red Eastern Screech Owl, the smallest owl in Georgia. Um, they only measure about eight to nine inches tall from their head to the tip of their tail. And then the Great Horn Owl, our largest owl in Georgia, can grow up to two feet tall, pretty big. And last is the Barn Owl. So we, uh, we just got through with baby season here at the Nature Center and our Rehabilitation Center with all the owls. Uh, you can tell that this juvenile owl has some of her still baby fluff there. So I wanted you to see a picture of a very young one compared to this adult. Um, why are people so captivated by owls? What is it that we find so exciting about them? I think it's because they remind us of us. They have these superhuman senses and adaptations and their eyesight is just one of their really, really important things for them. They can see in extremely low light. Their vision is about 30 times more sensitive than ours, which means when you are outside at nighttime, you can see about only 5% of what an owl can see. Um, one of the really cool adaptations for eyesight is called tapetum lucidum. That's very Latin there. They have a membrane behind the retina that actually reflects light. So they have another chance, more time to collect what they're seeing and it gives them a whole lot more chance to, to see well at night. Um, I know she's not showing you a whole lot about her eyes right now. She also has a, a membrane that goes across to clean her eye. This is called a nictitating membrane and you might see it go across her eye. I'll get her a little closer for you guys to be able to see. There you go. So if you see a little flicker of a horizontal something come across her eye, that's her membrane that keeps her from having to close her eyes, but keeps her eyes clean and moisturized. And when she's hunting, keeps her from having to close her eyes and blink and miss something. Um, so that tapetum lucidum helps her a lot. There are other animals that have that adaptation as well that you guys may know, um, cats and dogs and horses, cows, even fish have that kind of adaptation for seeing in the dark. So what else do we find so fascinating about owls? How about that whole idea that they can turn their head 360 degrees in a whole circle? Well, they can't do that. Um, if she did try to turn her head that far, her head would pop off. But they do have an extremely good amount of um, distance they can turn their heads. They're very flexible. So you and I, we could turn our heads this far, about almost 90 degrees to the side. We have less bones in our necks than owls do. They have about 14 vertebra, and we have about seven. Um, we also have an atlas that sort of holds us in place so we don't break our necks easily. But when she wants to turn her head, she can go 90 degrees. She can look straight back. She can come all the way over to this shoulder before she stops turning her head. She's gonna watch me, so I can't actually ask her to do that without an assistant present today. But um, it's pretty neat to see how much they turn their heads. Why do they do it? They wanna see everything around them. They can't cut their eyes back and forth like we do. So they have very fixed vision, and when they wanna see anything around them, they have to turn their head. Now, they'll check out the shape on her face. She is very used to being handled, so she's more like a teddy bear sometimes than a vicious predator. Um, this shape of her face, you can tell right here if you look at it, it's a, it's a sort of a satellite dish shape. Imagine what that would be for. She's got this place called a ruff. All the feathers right around her face are shaped into this direction. They're fashioned that way so it brings the sound right here. So her vision is here, her sound is right here. She can hear everything much better because of the way her feathers are shaped. And I think it's really cool that they also have asymmetrical hearing. So we have ears. 
these big earlobes, they have ears under their feathers that you can't see, but one would be way up here, and one's going to be down here. Why? So that she can hear things from all directions. She can pinpoint where the sound is coming from. So, I mean, I just can't imagine why people would think these animals were so incredible. I even think that they're a little bit more super powered kind of animals than our diurnal raptors. You could say our daytime raptors like hawks and owls and falcons. Um, they don't quite have one other thing that she has. When she's hunting, she has the cover of darkness. And so no one can see her coming. No one meaning her prey, the animals that she might eat. But she also has one other thing. She has silent flight. Lucy, can you show them that feather picture so they see the edge of that wing? Look at the... And if you... Get that right up. Okay, cool. I'm going to have one right here too. You can also see, but that one will be a lot easier for them to tell. Oh, well, look at the... There you go. Look at the edge of that wing, the very, very top of it, how it's serrated. It breaks against any kind of air moving toward it, so it separates the sound, whereas normal bird feathers push against the air so they can move faster. Owls actually move through it and then move silently. So it's pretty incredible that they can do that. They also have feathers down on their feet so that when they're flying, nothing can hear them coming. All right, so we've talked about all the things that are very incredible about owls. Raptors in general are very well equipped. Um, they have wonderful eyesight, all of them. They have these really, really sharp talons. You can see hers up close for catching their prey. And then the sharp beak that she's showing you a side view right now. Very sharp beak for tearing. So raptors eat the whole animal, typically, when they eat. They don't always swallow the whole thing in one bite. Sometimes her beak has to help her tear her food. But they always eat the whole thing. And then they have this stuff going through their system that they can't necessarily use for fuel. They collect some things in a part of their body called the gizzard down here. It's a muscle that constantly is bringing things in and crunching up objects that are not digestible for the owl, like fur from a rodent, feathers, bones. We can't eat that and digest that stuff, right? Well, they can swallow it, but they can't get it through their system except through their gizzard. And when it gets full, what does she do? She coughs it out. So you might see an owl or another type of raptor once in a great while on my glove, I'll see one of them go. Their eyes roll back and their mouth opens and they cough it out. And it looks a little bit like this beauty right here. That's from a great horned owl for sure because it's so big. But she has her own type of owl pellets daily. Every day that they eat, they pretty much will cough up a talent, I mean a pellet, from catching their food and digesting partially all of that stuff. Um, that also brings me a little bit to this animal story. Some of these things we've talked about with raptors and their skills. She was learning to be an expert flyer and hunter when she was just a juvenile back in 2002. And she was down in Camden County, ended up flying down probably to catch a fish in the river down there. And what happened was she got snagged on a fish hook that was hanging from a tree. Her wing actually got snagged and she couldn't get free. And so she kept struggling and kept struggling until she just was hanging there. 
her left wing was actually wound up in the fishing line. And by the next morning, when a fisherman came down to the river, he found her there, hanging from this line on the tree. Um, took her into get some help at a rehabilitation center, and she had to lose part of her left wing. It was amputated. And she's got arthritis on the right side now from hanging from that hook. I actually wanted to show you guys this. This is the actual fish hook that was taken from her wing back in 2002. And that kind of thing happens, unfortunately, too often with our wildlife, our riparian birds. It can, it can be a pelican, it could be a, a heron, even a falcon or an owl can get caught up in fishing line and does some terrible things. Whether it's something that we leave behind like that, or even something we might toss out on the side of a road, a lot of our raptors come to us because they've been hit by cars. And often rodents will be on the side of a road scavenging for any little tidbit they can find that might be called food. And who comes along to capture the rodents? All of our raptors. They're our best pest control method um, our raptors and our snakes in Georgia are the animals we value for that. So we're going to think for just a second about some things we can do that might be helpful to them. When we go outside and we manicure our lawns and try to get everything just beautiful, sometimes that's the worst thing you can do for the wildlife around you. You want to be able to leave some wild places like debris piles and rotting logs even tree snags that look unsightly to you, but might be a home or a nest for even an owl or a woodpecker. And I think it's really cool that we can do some things to actually make their lives better because we all share the same habitat, right? So I really appreciate you guys inviting me today. It's been really fun to be a part of this. And if you have some questions, the chat is really um, ready for you to add some things right there. Yes, please. So if you have any questions or see about the owl, go ahead and put them in the chat or in the Q&A and we'll read them as they come in. Um, Christy, while we're waiting for some questions, would you like to talk for a minute about the mission of the Chattahoochee Nature Center and what, you, what kind of work you do there? So the mission is very simple and yet very big. Um, our mission is to connect people to nature and we do it in a whole lot of ways. We are first an education center. We teach kids from all types of school ages, from pre-K, even three-year-olds up through high school. Um, we teach adult workshops, like the Certified Interpretive Guide here. Um, we also have community programs, birthday parties, and all types of scouts and other programs. We do adult education, as well as children and we do rehabilitation. So almost every one of our programs involves one of our non-releasable raptors or a snake. We even have a beaver on the premises and opossums. Wow. Um, so we just got a question in asking how long owls typically live. Well, it's, it's almost hard to believe that when we got her in 2002, she was already an adult. So we weren't sure how old she was. She's been with us 18 years now, at least she was at least probably three then. Mm -hmm. And in the wild, instead of 21 to 25 years like that, she would probably only live about eight. Some of our great horn owls and bigger raptors would live longer in the wild. What are, I'm curious to know, um, what are some of the other birds that you have in your rehabilitation program? Great question. So we have several different species of hawks. Um, at no time do we seem to have every one of them because there's so many that um, call Georgia home. We have bald eagles, we have red-tailed hawks, red-shouldered hawks, Cooper's hawks. Um, occasionally we have a peregrine falcon come in which is 
course, as you know, the fastest animal in the whole world. Um, and we have a merlin, which is a medium-sized falcon in Georgia. We have a very small hawk called a broad wing hawk. So pretty much all of those species of owls at one time or another we have here. And um, what animals do you have? I know that some of the animals you rehabilitate are not able to be released into the wild. Um, how many animals do you currently have working at the Nature Center? Um, I can't tell you exactly right now how many animals total, somewhere around 90 resident animals. Okay. Um, our rehabilitation is a little bit on hold right now because our center is closed right. due to COVID-19 like so many. Um, normally we have about 650 cases of rehabilitating animals during the year. Wow. Um, we had a question come in asking, why do you not, why do we not see um, many barn owls in Georgia? That's a really good question. So what is the nature of a barred owl's habitat? Where do they like to be and what do we provide for them? In the past, barns were everywhere and structures that they could get inside and make nests. They could always find mice, mm -hmm. barns. How many barns do we have now? How many places do we have that we allow rodents to frequent and be available for food? Um, they're also, they seem to be very secretive compared to other owls. The great horn owl is fearless. The barred owl is a little less um, <laughs> vicious, you might say, as, as she does the teddy bear look again. So I think of the barn owls as the most elusive, and they also seem to be able to hunt totally in deep night by sound. That's wonderful. Um, so I want to mention to everybody, we put the information in the chat for where to find Chattahoochee Nature Center online on social media. Um, and you can go to their website to learn more about the programs that they offer and the work that they do and to support them if you're so moved. Um, unless we have some more questions come in or Christy, if you have some more information that you'd like to share, I know that um, Jonathan and Jason have one more image that they want to discuss before we do a longer Q&A at the end. So just share with us anything that you guys are seeing out there, any questions that you have or stories that you would like to, to tell us. We always want to hear and we'd love to be able to share a little bit more with you. Yeah. All right. Well, so Christy and I are going to pause for a minute, put our feathered friend away um, and we will be back in just a few minutes to do some more Q&A. Jonathan and Jason, if you're ready. Oh, actually, I will say we just had one more question come in. Um, so why don't we go ahead and answer that? And the question is asking, what do you feed the owl? And are you feeding them rodents? Are you catching them? Where are they coming from? That is a really great question too. We, we often want to answer that question because we always need more help with our feeding budget around here, especially during this time while we're closed. Um, the animals are being taken care of on a daily basis, of course. She had fish today, I can tell. Um, that is one of her favorite foods in the wild. She doesn't get it very often here, but we do supply her with fish sometimes. She gets rats and mice as part of her normal fare. And always these are animals that are raised in a very safe environment that we have to purchase or are donated to us. And she doesn't eat her food alive anymore. That's one other important thing. Our non-releasable birds are only given animals that are frozen, thawed out, and then they can safely eat them. Same with our snakes, they eat animals that are not moving anymore. Thank you so much. Okay, it looks like we might have one more question. We have someone who raised a hand. Um, but we can go ahead and hold on to that question for the Q&A at the end, um, unless you have anything else that you'd like to share, Christy. No, thank you guys so much. 
Thank you so much. We're going to turn it over to Jonathan and Jason for to talk about one more artwork and then Christy and I will be back for the Q&A. Thank you so much, Christy. Thank you. That was amazing. So as they're getting the last image, we just wanted to have a wrap up image to bring us back to art and nature. Um, but we're so grateful for our guest uh, appearances. And um, really, this is an image to just talk about how birds continue to inspire us in our everyday life, but also artists. Um, as you can see, this is a still life by an artist named Katya Oxman, a, a printmaker. Um, based in Washington, D.C. now. Um, and she often includes images from museum visits that she's made. So in addition to an orchid that she grew um, and this oriental rug as a background, you can see this uh, postcard from uh, the National Gallery of Art and their um, impression of John James Audubon's flamingo, which is a very famous image from his 435 other images because he made everything at life size and so therefore sometimes he had to pose them in very interesting ways to make them fit onto the size sheet that he had available. Um, other artists today that are making really interesting work um, about birds and sort of ecology in general, Maya Lin has a project called What is Missing? Um, and it's a memorial to uh, species that are in decline, that may go extinct during our lifetime. I invite you to check it out. She has a website um, and it's just whatismissing.net. You can actually add your own story about um, seeing less of something than you did say in your childhood and help kind of create an ethos of uh, how we want to preserve our and these animals and plants and um, have them be a resource and available for future generations. Um, we also, Jason and I worked with an artist in Nebraska. Um, she's actually based in Florida, but Rachel Simmons is another artist um, that we know who works on uh, themes about ecology, global climate change, and we specifically worked with her on a project um, about birds, um, and Jason ended up um, displaying the bird prints that were created in the workshop at the Audubon Center where he uh, works every day. Um, so we'd love to take any other questions. Um, we can also repost the information about the Nature Center. And Jason and I also, if you have questions that you think of later that you'd like to know about birds or birds and art, um, please feel free to email us uh, via our, our respective institutional websites. Anybody have any further thoughts or questions? All right. Let me see, I'm gonna attempt to, I see that um, Joyce had a question and I'm going to attempt to connect her to speak. Hopefully I can do that. Great. This is a first for me. All right, Joyce? Hear me? Yes, we can hear you. What's your question for everyone? Well, I signed up for this uh, serendipitously. I'm an art historian and I just saw it online and I wonder if you were on Eastern Standard Time. You probably were, but I missed it. So I just got on at five o'clock. If you guys start at four, and I'm sorry I missed it. But I'm eager to see, I, I do teach American art, although next semester I'm already slotted for two sessions, uh, two different courses in French art. But nevertheless, uh, I, I guess I don't have a question except that how can I continue uh, on, uh, the, I don't know if it's a site, you have experts here in the arts of birds, and although I know Audubon and have taught that, I would like to continue this connection with you people. So just let me know how I do that. Hey Joyce, we actually met in Paris. I don't know if you remember. 
Um, but I'd be happy to dialogue with you about more artists. And I can even send you the PowerPoint that we used, which is all uh, images from the permanent collection of the museum where I work, which is the Columbus Museum here in Georgia. So I'd be happy to reach out to you or you can email me and we can dialogue. I'd be happy to do that. Oh, wonderful. Um, were you, are you referring to the Terra Foundation conference? Well, i sorry, I didn't yes. recognize you, but yes. Thank you. Let's be in touch. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you all. And you will also be able to um, stream today's talk on our social media and on our website. So once it, once the live is over, you'll be able to go back and see the discussion from the beginning. All right, so if you have, let me look. I see we've got some questions in the Q&A. Um, let's see. So we have someone asking um, if you are aware of the photographer Joel Satori's project to document all of the endangered species in the world uh, that is partly sponsored by National Geographic. Yes, I actually happen to know Joel Satori personally. He is a Nebraskan. Um, he has actually shot pictures at Spring Creek Prairie Audubon Center where I work um, because we have a big open area that he can bring some of the animals in. Um, he is a huge, along with um, amazing photographer, um, very conservation minded. The whole photo art project is to be able to raise awareness on endangered species and funds for them. Um, he donates to local organizations. He um, very graciously um, let us um, use one of his prints for a um, auction to raise money for our conservation efforts as well. Um, but yes, that's an absolutely wonderful project. Um, amazing images. And I believe there was an opening exhibit early on here in Nebraska at the um, State Museum uh, Morrow Hall on the campus of the uh, University of Nebraska. Um, but yes, thank you for sharing that. He did some amazing work. Um, anything else you know about Joel, Jonathan, that I'm forgetting? No, you know way more than I do. Cool. Yeah, check it out. It's, um, I believe there was an, there's now several versions of the original ARC project. It's still working on it um, to add more species to try to capture um, some of them that are very hard to find. Um, but there's one main book that started and then they have split it into smaller books like one about birds and one about reptiles like, in different types of groups. Let's see. So we also have another question um, in the chat asking Jonathan if you know how many bird images we have in the collection and if you would have ever done or would consider doing an exhibition on it. Um, so we do have more images than we were able to show. Um, Jason and I realized very quickly that we could spend two hours talking about the art and we wanted to give time to our Bard Al guest and Christy at the Chattahoochee Nature Center. Um, I'd love to do an exhibition. It would be easy to do and we'll be doing some permanent collection shows coming up in the next couple of years, especially because of COVID and how it's kind of uh, made us look at our exhibition schedule and adapt. Um, so keep your eyes out for that. Um, I can say though, um, all of the images, um, the museum specifically collects actively. Um, so most, if not almost all of the images are gonna be by American artists. Um, the French artist that I showed is a little bit unusual, but we have it in the collection because it was made in this country. It documents a species that is um, part of our ecosystem and also was kind of created in this uh, place that we now call the United States before it was, you know, a, a real country. Um, so yes, we have a few more, but almost all of them are American art and um, we'd love to show them and be in touch. We'll, we'll Jason, maybe we can get Jason to write half the labels so I don't have to do it all. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk. <laughs> All right, well, I don't see any other questions popping up. 
Um, but I do see that Jason had a great suggestion for when we're able to visit museums in person that you can go and use it to do museum birding. Go bird the museum and see what species you can find there. Yeah, that's a really fun and simple way to um, always include birding. This came about because, especially now, um, with people sheltering at home in different places of the country, um, virtual birding has been big. Um, watching like Google Earth to see if you can find birds in the imagery. Um, <laughs> but we used to do this in art just because it's, it's two things that I enjoy. Um, so I always am noticing birds and trying to like, so we would, we made it a fun competition. Friends, we kind of split up in a large museum and walked around and see how many birds we could find. And it's, you'd be, what it does is just like anything when you're out birding is you find more things to interact with. Um, you look at a painting you've seen a bunch differently um, or in a new way. So it's, it's a great way to relook at things you've already maybe seen or find new things. Yes, I'm, I always advocate for close looking at a museum. Seeing all of those little details um, really change your perception of the work of art. So we have one more raised hand. Lynn, I'm going to click and unmute your microphone. So Lynn, you should be able to speak now. Oh, she's muted. Oh. There you go. Okay, there we go. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, actually, and I, I just want to talk about the owl uh, that I just saw before. Yeah, what would you um, that owl? Uh, and, and I kind of heard that um, <clears throat> that uh, that it actually eats a fish, m mice, and mouse. Wait, but um, but do you even catch the mice or? mouse to feed it or does the owl just catch it by itself? Me? <laughs> <laughs> so the owl would normally catch the mice by itself, of course, and they do that on a daily basis. But now that they're here with us and they are injured animals, we don't want them to come to any further harm at all by trying to catch their food. And it might actually crawl right out of their cage, so that wouldn't be good either. So we don't feed them live mice, we feed them frozen. Sort of like a rat and mice grocery store is where we get their food from. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you for the question. And I'm going to, Carrie, I see that you have your hand raised as well, so I'm gonna unmute you. Um, so, um, um, excuse me, Chrissy, um, what's your owl, um, enemies, like, why do, um, your owl has, like, sharp claws, claws? Why does it have sharp claws? Uh-huh. Well, if you had to go outside and catch your own food while it was still living, you would need to have some pretty sharp talons on your feet to catch with. So what's, the, what's your owl's enemy is? What kind of enemies would an owl have? Your owl's what we What we like to say, we nature nerds and birders like to all say that owls are some of the top of their food chain. So they're gonna be an apex predator or some of those animals that don't have too many other things that would eat them but one of the only problems that they have with anything that harms them is things that people do sometimes. Um, okay. The enemies of people. Uh, in mind. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Carrie. Christy and Jason, that's a great segue to maybe mention one or two more things that we can do as humans to help support birds and uh, make sure that they're around for future generations. Yeah, I'll go real quick, Jonathan, with one of my favorites right now, an important one. I hear a lot of people love birds, they wanna see them. I'm not seeing very many in my yard. Um, and when I look at their yard, it's all turf grass. Um, one of the biggest things you can do to help uh, birds right now is plant native plants, have more trees, shrubs, flowers for bugs, 
get native plants in your yard or in your city, um, in a park, maybe in your church um, area, that will provide habitat and food for those birds. You'll see and enjoy them more and they'll survive more um, and not have to like worry about where they go and only dealing with, you know, road, yard, or building, right? That's great, Jason. Um, another thing I was thinking of on the tail end of that was we tend to have birds that hit windows a lot. And that's a big Audubon thing now to see if we can keep that from happening so much. We actually have these dots all over the windows in our buildings here that were made by you to keep the birds from running into the window. <laughs> yep, and it's, they're really easy to put on and easy to find. We happen to use Feather Friendly, it's called. And you just, it's a little strip of dots and you stick them on and you barely notice them once they're there when you're looking out the window. But birds can then tell that it is a solid surface and not a mirrored area so they won't hit that. So that's another great one. Yes. Thank you so much to Jason and Christy for speaking. Um, we're so grateful for our feathered friend who made an appearance. Um, thank you to Bridget and Lucy from the Columbus Museum who worked to coordinate and keep us on track. We're grateful for your help. Um, please do, um, if you enjoyed today's program, please think about supporting the Chattahoochee Nature Center or the Columbus Museum, or if you're based in Nebraska, uh, the Wildlife Center where Jason works, which is part of the Audubon Society. Um, and we'd love um, for feedback about today's program. Um, so another way you can help us out is if you have other ideas or topics that you'd like to um, have discussions about, we'd love to hear them and uh, consider them for future programming as the pandemic uh, continues. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Jason and Christy again. We loved having you um, join us and we'll keep thinking of ways to bring art and nature together. Thanks. Thanks so much, everyone. That was great. Thank you, everyone. We hope to see you again soon. Stay safe.